We talked today about nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress, and how all of them interplay with one another. We're gonna start off with nutrition because all of us eat at some point, most every day. Um, and we know from research that there is a distinct relationship between what we're eating and our levels of stress and our overall mood. There are certain foods and substances that tend to increase stress and anxiety, things like coffee. And there are others that tend to decrease stress, feelings of stress and anxiety. Um, and that may be individual to you and the amounts of those foods that increase or decrease stress and anxiety may be individual to you. So if you're not sure what causes that for yourself, you might wanna start out with just um, creating a little journal of what you're eating and about an hour or two hours later, how you're feeling in terms of stress and anxiety. Um, keeping that for about a week may start to give you some, in, some information about yourself to play around with a little bit more. You should also keep in mind that environmental stressors may also additionally impact these anti-anxiety or increased anxiety effects of the food and the substances. Um, and for females, this may also be impacted by the timing of your cycle. So while a week is a great start, you may need to periodically check in because how you're doing and how food impacts you today may be different than during finals week. So substances that we know can aggravate anxiety. As I mentioned earlier, caffeine, which makes me sad because it's one of my favorite things. However, it has a, we know it has a stimulating effect. It's a stimulant. And so it causes our body to um, produce additional neurotransmitters to kind of wake us up. That's one of the good things about coffee. However, if you have anybody who's had too much caffeine, Caffeine at one point knows that feeling of the jitters and you may feel a little on edge, you may feel a little shaky. And if you have mental health issues like generalized anxiety disorder, panic attacks, this can, caffeine can make those significantly worse. So you may want to cut down caffeine to something like a cup of coffee or two cups of caffeinated tea per day or a small diet soda, um, or you may need to cut it out entirely. Now I do say diet soda because sugar can impact, have an anxiety increasing impact as well. And so a regular soda may impact you differently than a diet soda. There are other stimulants that we might need to consider as well. One of those is nicotine. While most smokers will tell you that that experience of smoking in the moment may feel like a break and may help reduce anxiety. Nicotine is a stimulant. We know that over time, it actually does, can increase anxiety. So while you may be feeling a little bit better in the moment from the deep inhalation and exhalation of the smoking or of the vaping, um, throughout the day, it's actually increasing your risk for anxiety. So you may tend to sleep less well than non-smokers. And if you do, again, have um, already have these anxious experiences or these uh, mental health disorders of generalized anxiety disorder or panic attacks, then you may need to cut that out of your life entirely. Again, this is something else you can experiment with. Same thing with um, some other stimulant drugs, over-the-counter drugs containing caffeine, including headache medicines that might contain caffeine, prescription antihistamines um, like Benadryl, like um, Sudafed, as well as other prescription drugs that are classified as stimulants like Ritalin and Adderall may increase anxiety. So if you are taking those prescription drugs that, and you have these experiences of increased anxiety or you have these diagnosed disorders, you may wanna to talk to your doctor about adjusting those medications to something that may be a better fit for you but also recreational drugs that are stimulants. So if you are, are using those or choosing to use those and you already have these anxiety disorders or just anxious experiences, uh, then you may want to choose to cut those out as well to help reduce your anxiety. Substances that cause just in general additional stress and inflammation on the body include salt and sugar. Um, as I mentioned with the sugar earlier, 
as tasty and as wonderful as it can be sometimes, um, our bodies, especially in high doses, can start to struggle when we're processing lots of large amounts of sugar. Um, it can raise our blood sugar over time. And if you are hypoglycemic um, or diabetic, that can be particularly problematic. But even for those of us who are not, that can be problematic for us. Um, salt depletes the body of potassium, which is really important for nervous functioning. And so we tend to have a lot of both salt and sugar in our diets today, especially if we're eating a lot of pre-processed foods. Those tend to be packed with lots of salt and sugar. So you may, in paying attention to kind of how the different substances impact your body, want to particularly pay attention to, am I eating a lot of pre-prepared foods? Am I making a lot of foods myself? Or if you're eating at the dining hall, am I eating things that are prepared there rather than come out of a box like breakfast cereals? So some things that you might want to consider in terms of changes to your diet and to your lifestyle, if you are interested in reducing stress, is re reducing or eliminating caffeine, especially as you're paying attention to its impact on your body, if you're noticing that even small amounts of caffeine, even one cup or two cups of coffee a day, is increasing your stress, then you may need to cut it out entirely. Same thing with smoking. Um, while that act in the moment and the long inhalations and exhalations might feel good and might feel like they're reducing stress, that nicotine over time is likely to increase stress and anxiety. So you may need to cut that out of your life as well. And reducing intake of other substances um, that can increase stress on the body. So that, again, as we talked about salt, that may need, mean needing to decrease it to as little as one gram per day um, eliminating the intake of sugar or at least greatly reducing it to as best you can. Um, and replacing processed foods with whole foods, fruits, vegetables, grains, um, things that don't require much or any processing at all. So we're going to pay attention to our foods, see how they impact us. We're going to start getting rid of things that we know are increasing our stress and anxiety or at least reducing them. Alcohol is another, while it is a depressant, not a stimulant, it still can impact our overall feeling of anxiety based upon how our body processes it. Um, so trying for a general, more well-rounded diet, what everybody tells us we should be doing anyway and is really hard to do, is more likely to have us um, feeling a little bit better, a little less stressed, a little more, a little less anxious. You may consider taking some supplements. Again, I recommend talking with your doctor about these um, beforehand, just because with other medications you're taking or other um, situations in your body, they may or may not be right for you, but B vitamins um, can help to reduce stress. Um, reducing the feeling of stress. Same thing with vitamin C and calcium magnesium supplements. You might also consider taking fish oil, um, which has been shown to be helpful for depression or GABA um, or tryptophan, which are, can, are shown to be helpful for anxiety. Again, particularly with these, you do want to be talking with your doctor um, because they can be cause interaction effects with other food and other prescriptions. So movement, we all know we should be moving more. And for some of us, we already know how good moving makes us feel. Um, that we have any runners, we often talk about the runners high, but even just taking a simple walk or like walking around the building an extra lap before walking into it for class can help us to feel a little better, a little less anxiety and a little more energized. So it is one of the most powerful tools for um, reducing panic attacks because it helps our body literally to physically move the, those neurochemicals that cause anxiety through our body faster and process it faster than if we're just sitting and not moving. There 
are some other benefits of exercise. Reducing skeletal muscular tension um, helps reduce that feeling of just being tight and uncomfortable. And maybe pain it might be to the point of pain, but for many of us, it's just tight and uncomfortable. If you've been sitting, studying for hours and hours, and then you start to move around, you know exactly what I'm talking about, of that like your muscles are just uncomfortable. Um, and the more we do sit, the more sedentary we are, the more prone to that experience we are. And that being uncomfortable is going to impact our mood in general. So moving helps to increase our metabolism, which again, as I mentioned, helps to move these chemicals, um, these neurochemicals through our body, things like adrenaline, um, thyroxine, and their presence tends to help increase that state of arousal. So by helping them move through the body and processes they're supposed to, um, that helps to reduce that state of arousal and that vigilance. It also, depending upon the type of exercise, help you just get rid of some of that pent up frustration. Um, I don't know about you all, but if you've ever gone on a like hard run or had a really hard weightlifting session after a really frustrating day, yeah, it can feel amazing to get rid of that frustration by working out extra hard. And these frustrations, um, if you have tendency to have phobias or if you do have um, panic attacks or just simple experiences of panic and hypervigilance, getting rid of these frustrations that help to cause those can overall impact your mood and make you feel a little bit better. So there are also additional benefits, enhanced oxygenation of the brain and blood is helping us to feel more alert and awake without the caffeine. So you have the benefits of that kind of buzzy awakeness without the drawbacks. And the stimulation of endorphins, as I mentioned earlier with that runner's high, after we work out, some of us get the experience of an endorphin boost, which helps to um, ease pain and discomfort and increase your overall sense of well-being. Some additional benefits, um, lowering pH, which increases energy, increased subjective feelings of well-being. Like we've done a lot of research on all of the benefits of exercise. Uh, there's a ton of them. We just need to find ways of moving. And again, it doesn't have to be super advanced, um, super athletic movements. It can be as simple as adding some extra walking to your day. That can help reduce depression, increase self-esteem. So we do have research on specific types of workouts that are particularly good for different types of um, mental health disorders. But again, just increasing a little bit of extra walking would be helpful. For GAD and uh, panic disorder, we know that aerobic exercise is best. And that we know that we should be exercising pretty regularly most days out of the week. And about 20 to 30 minutes per session is our optimal time frame. So it doesn't have to take up your whole day, but it should be a concerted amount of time. And if you're paying attention to your heart rate, um, there are optimal intensity kind of heart rate target zones we might want to be looking at, but not all of us have access to a heart rate monitor or anything of that nature. Um, and that is not necessary to get started by any stretch of the imagination. Sleep. So as college students, we've got a lot pulling on our time, a lot pulling on our ener energy and interest. Um, we're going to class during the day. We may also be working and we're being social with friends and there may be activities going on until late in the night that we're really interested in participating in. But the combination of all of those really starts to take a toll on our sleep. And while you may feel fine pulling an all-nighter or two, after a couple of nights, you're going to start to feel yourself slow really quickly. You're not going to be thinking quite as well. Um, and you're going to be more sensitive to anxiety-inducing experiences and things of that nature. So getting good sleep, enough sleep, 
every night, a consistent schedule is really helpful and really important for regulating mood, decreasing anxiety, um, and reducing the uh, predisposition to panic attacks. So the vast majority of us are not getting anywhere near enough sleep. Um, and at the amount, exact amount of sleep we need changes over time. So right now you may be fine with only about seven hours, um, but even in a year or two, you might need more or less than that. Most people can't get by on less than six hours a night. Um, and most people can't do very well with just six hours. So figuring that out for yourself, again, keeping another journal um, to see what is the ideal amount of sleep for you can be really helpful. So things that cause sleep deprivation, not giving ourselves enough time. Um, you may be the type of person, especially if you have um, some sort of anxiety disorder to begin with, that lays down to sleep, gives yourself enough time, and then everything you've ever thought about comes flooding back to you and you have an entire list running through your head and you can't shut off your brain and get to sleep. Same thing with just general stress, anxiety, depression um, may make it difficult to sleep. If our environment is not well set up for sleep, then that may be impacting our sleep as well, especially if we're living with roommates in a dorm where they might be coming and going and lights coming into our room at different times. We may have to make some changes to our physical environment in order to enhance better sleep. Um, also, if you are on a schedule like where you're working nights or where you're working nights some days out of the week, but not others, um, that could have an impact. So lots of different possibilities of what can cause us to have less than ideal sleep. Symptoms of sleep depri deprivation, as I mentioned earlier, just general fatigue and lack of energy. Um, these mood changes, I don't know about you all, but when I don't get enough sleep, I'm just a little grumpy. I'm less easygoing than I normally am. Um, and little things that normally wouldn't bother me just start to rub me wrong. Um, you can have social problems. Some, some of that is because we are less likely to physically see and interpret social cues quickly um, because our brain neural processing is slowing down. And some of it is you're not paying attention as well because it's hard to concentrate when we haven't slept well. So we may, social cues that we might typically be able to be pay, paying attention to, we might just totally miss. So that might result in us getting into fights with roommates, partners, friends more frequently. Um, it might be what things like road rage you might be feeling more frequently if you're not getting enough sleep. So we had a lot of benefits of improving our sleep as best we can. We think better during the day. Um, we're just generally in a better mood. We're waking up fully refreshed, feeling good, not feeling like we have to pound six Red Bulls to human for the day. And we're gonna wake up not already feeling super stressed, which is really important for um, just kind of having a less stressful day in general if you're waking up feeling super stressed and overwhelmed, that's just going to snowball throughout the day. Improved memory, because we do all of our memory consolidation while we're sleeping. So things that you're studying during the day, your brain is actually like putting into your long-term memory while you're sleeping. So if you're not getting sleep, that's not happening. Again, as I mentioned earlier, improving concentration and reducing risks of accidents, both car accidents, serious things, and like general clumsiness, because the signals are moving a little bit faster through our body when we've gotten good sleep than when we haven't. So things we can do to improve our sleep are having a consistent schedule, going to bed and waking up same time every single day. That includes weekends. And I know that's hard because we want to sleep in on weekends and we want to catch up from the sleep we might not have gotten during the week. Or maybe we want to stay out super late Friday night. But having that consistent schedule, whatever set schedule you need for your lifestyle and your um, requirements in your lifestyle, 
getting seven to eight hours every night is really important. So you might wanna try um, seeing what kind of eight hour time frame you could dedicate to sleep every day, even if that is something like 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. You don't have to go to bed at 10 o'clock. I'm not telling you you gotta go to bed at 10 o'clock, but if you want to, that's fine too. But finding a consistent time frame that you can keep to seven days a week within an hour or so. So maybe some days you're going to bed an hour later, but not three or four hours later. Um, having a healthy diet, avoiding alcohol, limiting caffeine, and especially limiting caffeine before bedtime. So like after lunch, probably might wanna avoid caffeine of any sort. Um, and drinking a lot of water Keeping us hydrated helps us to sleep, helps us to feel better, helps us to feel less anxious. Um, keeping the environment of our bedroom ideal for sleeping. So reducing lights, leaving TVs out of our bedroom, um, using our bed for sleeping only, not for like reading or playing video games or watching TV or doing homework in. The more we can keep that space special just for sleeping, um, the more likely we are, our brains are to associate, associate it with sleeping. So when we lay down, our brain won't be thinking of all the things we didn't do or didn't read in our textbook. It's going to be thinking, okay, it's time for us to sleep and starting that process of relaxing and shutting down on its own. And avoiding napping. I know how great a nap can feel on a day when you're feeling tired and overwhelmed. But it also typically interferes with the ability to get to sleep later on in the night, especially if you're taking longer naps. So as you're paying attention to how all of this impacts you, if you are a regular napper, just kind of note what times you're taking naps and if that's impacting your ability to get to sleep that night. If it is, you might need to cut out or cut back, especially on those late afternoon naps. Making sure that we're getting plenty of exercise um, in that 20 to 30 minutes daily, four to five days a week um, of something, again, this could be as simple as walking if that's all you feel up to and that's all you have easy access to. And we do want to generally avoid strenuous exercise within a couple of hours of bedtime. There are some folks who can do perfectly fine going for an intense run and immediately coming back and going to bed but not all of us are that way. The vast majority of us are probably not that way. So trying to avoid that right before bed, unless you know um, that it's fine for your body. As I mentioned, improving that sleep environment, um, making it comfortable, having a comfortable mattress, pillows, sheets. I know, especially in a dorm room, you can't always control all of these things, but controlling what you can, making sure it's a really comfy, cozy environment just can help make it easier to get to sleep um, and to stay asleep. Finding a comfortable temperature for both getting and staying asleep. On the whole, people do better with sleeping when the room is a little bit colder than normal. Um, you may want to tinker with exact temperature that works for you. And if you're living with a roommate, with your roommate, so you're not freezing them out as well. Um, and avoiding non-sleep activities while in bed and keeping any sort of noise to a minimum. So that may mean you need to use a white noise machine or some soft music or something to drown out noises if your apartment has very thin walls or if you're in a dorm where you might be hearing somebody else. Um, and also finding a clock that is partially hidden or obscured so that those bright numbers are not distracting you from sleep. You may also wanna try um, scents. Lavender has been shown to help promote, promote scent, uh, promote better sleep. So adding like a little spritz of lavender in your room before you go to bed might be um, something, again, just playing around to see what works best for you within the con confines and constraints of the environment that you're in. And getting into a bedtime routine we want to get our brain and our body prepared for sleep as much as possible. So you may want to drink some hot herbal tea or warm milk to kind of calm the body and help feel like um, a little relaxing 
bit before you go to bed. You may want to read or listen to audiobooks. If you're going to be reading, it's best to have a light behind you, not in front of you, um, so that you're not getting that bright light right in front of your eyes. Also, it's better to read a physical book than to be um, reading an ebook unless you have one that's like particularly set up so that you're not getting um, the blue light from it. Listening to audiobooks, especially kind of on a lower volume, can be really helpful as well. Doing some sort of crossword puzzle or Sudoku, anything that doesn't require a lot of in-depth complex thought um, can be helpful. Music, wearing comfortable sleepwear, doing some sort of yoga or relaxation movement, um, just anything that helps you kind of start to feel like you're ready for the end of the day, ready for bed, ready to put your day away and not have to worry about things. Um, if you are a person who the moment your head hits the pillow and you start to have all of the thoughts of the day, all of the to-do list checklist items popping up, you may want to keep a little notebook by your bed that when you start to have those items pop up in your brain, if they are feeling super pressing and I cannot go to bed without writing them down, your little notebook is right there. You can go ahead and write them down and take care of that. So you don't have to take those worries and those stressors to bed with you. You won't forget about it. It will be written down for you for tomorrow. There are a load of apps to help with nutrition, with stress, with sleep. Um, that you can download and help you see what works for you. Things like Nutrition Journal, My Fitness Pal, Sleep Cycle, which is super handy because it creates a like little window of wake up time and it pays attention to your movement throughout the night to see when you are like in a slightly lighter sleep um, stage of sleep during that time frame, and it will wake you up during that slightly lighter sleep stage to make it easier for you to wake up big fan of that one. So doing anything just to kind of start this process for yourself to have better sleep, nutrition, exercise will help overall reduce your stress. You don't have to take on all of it right now. Start where it feels easier, easiest to do so and then keep going. If you um, notice that certain things are making you feel anxious and you're moving from your diet, then you may kind of find other things that you want to change or enhance. Let it snowball um, and hopefully in a few weeks, months, and years, you're gonna be feeling better and better and better. And you're also gonna be feeling more empowered because you know so much more about yourself and what impacts you. And you can make conscious choices to engage with those things or avoid those things. Good luck to you and thanks for coming today.